Hello and welcome to Washington Week's Backstory, where we take you behind the stories you've been reading about all week long. Tonight I'm joined by Pete Williams, Chief Justice Correspondent for NBC News, and we're going to talk about something a little different this time. We're going to talk about a member of the Supreme Court who lately has been talking a lot about herself. Her name is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's been on the court for a while, but she also has a moniker, the Notorious RBG. <laughs> All of a sudden, I don't know many other uh, Supreme Court justices who have rap pseudonyms. There are none. Why has she gotten, why is she blown up like this all of a sudden? <laughs> well, it really started at the end of last term. Uh, she was very outspoken about her male colleagues on the Supreme Court, saying that they completely didn't get it in the decision, the Hobby Lobby case about contraceptives. She was very outspoken. People really picked up on that and began to look back at this woman's career, who was an early champion of women's rights. And they sort of threaded it all together. And she kind of just, it seemed to be a moment where it hit all the right notes and younger women started to pick up on it. There are Ruth Bader Ginsburg t-shirts. You can get a Ruth Bader Ginsburg tattoo on your arm that's a <laughs> portrait. And then this whole thing about notorious RBG. Now, of course, she is a Supreme Court justice, so her clerks had to explain what that meant. <laughs> to her. But now she gets it and she thinks it's pretty cool. Well, the interesting thing about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just tell us a little bit about her background, where she came from and how long she's been on the court. Well, of course, she's from Brooklyn originally, uh, and uh, she's, uh, I guess there are three or four Supreme Court justices now from New York, Sonia Sotomayor, Antonin Scalia, he's actually from New Jersey. Uh, so there's a lot of New Yorkers on the court, but she Elena was, Kagan. Elena Kagan, Kagan, right. She was a, uh, a, an early lawyer for the ACLU uh, when they began to litigate women's rights issues. And she was the Thurgood Marshall of women's rights issues. She used sort of the same technique of small issues that could connect to larger issues for women. And as she put it, she wanted to break down the stereotypes that women could not be policemen, firemen, uh, airplane pilots, serve on juries, uh, go to the Virginia Military Institute. Um, uh, that was her decision when she was a Supreme Court justice. But as, as an early uh, advocate for women's rights, she, she really pointed the direction to a lot of the big changes now that we take for granted. And yet it is said that one of her best friends on the court is someone who is her ideological opposite, Antonin Scalia. It is, it is said, and it is said by them. They are big pals. Uh, they, they snipe at each other constantly in their opinions. <laughs> Scalia says some terrible things about her opinions. She's a little more measured, but they don't agree on many things. But they do agree on a few things. They agree on opera. They're both huge opera fans. Uh, there is an opera that's been written about the two of them, about which they are both delighted. <laughs> the justice is blind. How could they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. How many times must I tell you, dear Mr. Justice Scalia, you'd spare us such pain if you'd just entertain this idea. Justice Scalia is imprisoned in a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> for excessive dissentings. <laughs> and I come to his rescue in a dr most dramatic way. I break through a glass ceiling <laughs> <laughs> to rescue him from his plight. They have many more things in common uh, about life than they do about the law. Sometimes I think when you, when you Forget that the Supreme Court is a club that there are, there are very few members of, and so they have to have a lot more in common than we would think just looking at five to four rules. Yes, although, as you know, they've also been described as nine scorpions in a bottle. Well, there's so. that. There's <laughs> that. Um, I, it's interesting. She got more attention recently because of the footage of her falling asleep quite conspicuously at a State of the Union address. That's not the first time she's done it. No, it's what most of us would like to do during the State of the <laughs> Union address. Here's the thing about the Supreme Court justices. They can't be perceived as uh, approving or disapproving for anything the president says. So while everyone else is jumping up and showing their appreciation, for the most part, the Supreme Court justices just have to sit there. So it's a pretty passive experience to start with. 
<laughs> this is the second time this has happened. And both times she blames it on this dinner that the justices have before they go over. And it's not all the court, by the way. It's I've been in recent years, six or seven of them. So they all have dinner, uh, and, and she says that Justice Kennedy, who's in California, always brings a really nice California wine, and that she has a few too many pops, and it gets to her during this speech. We're not, at least I wasn't, a hundred percent sober because before we went to the State of the Union, <laughs> um, we had we had dinner together, and I vowed this year just sparkling water, stay away from the wine. But in the end, the dinner was so delicious it needed wine to accompany. <laughs> so, oh. so, I said, so I got a call when I came home from one of my granddaughters, and she said, "Bubby, you were sleeping at the State of the Union." <laughs> She was sitting between Justice Kennedy and Justice Breyer, who yes. I believe who were elbowing her throughout. Yes. There are a yes. couple of shots in which both of the other women on the court are looking at her disapprovingly, right. And, right. And, and you begin to wonder about that. But it also raises other questions, even though she has that very charming story about why it happens, about her age and her health, which is the reason pe people often have talked about Justice Ginsburg in the past several years, but there's no sign that she's going anywhere. If you have not heard Ruth Bader Ginsburg say that she's not about to retire, then uh, clearly you've been asleep for the last 10 years. How old is she? She's 81. Uh, and she, uh, she has had two battles with cancer, and um, she's recovered beautifully from both of them. But this all got started when a couple of legal scholars started writing articles saying, look, Supreme Court justices hang around too long. And Justice Ginsburg and, to some extent, Justice Breyer have this great liberal legacy. And we need them to step down now while there's still a Democrat in the White House, because we don't know who's going to get elected next, and let's give somebody else a chance. It was pretty unchivalrous, really, trying to shove her off the court. And she's been making it pretty clear that she's not going anywhere. Now, she had said that at one time her model was Justice Louis Brandeis. And he served on the court until he was 82. Now she is knocking on that door. And I think she wants everybody to know she's not going anywhere. Well, as long as she's enjoying herself and she feels like she's on top of the job and she doesn't have wine just before she reads her decisions, <laughs> I think she's Well, she's and, what, and what she has said is, as long as I feel that I've got it up here and I'm, right. you know, I'm, on, uh, I'm hitting all eight and I feel I can, I can uh, do my job, then I'll stay. If I feel I start to slip, then I'll quit. The Notorious RBG. Pete Williams, thanks <laughs> a lot. My pleasure.